Well, good morning. Welcome to our In the Word podcast this week. Today is Tuesday, May 21st. We are glad that you guys have uh, stuck with us this long. Here we are getting close to being six months into the year, almost at that halfway point of our journey through the Word. And so we are uh, excited about that, excited about you continuing. I've had so many just great uh, so much great feedback from you guys who who have been sharing just how how much you're getting out of these insights and the different things that are being shared. So, thank you for sticking with us. Thank you for devoting time uh, to being in the Word this year and just devoting that. Time. We believe uh, with all of our hearts that God is going to do great things as we as a church are focused on being in the Word on in in, in communicating with God and spending time with God. That God is going to bless that uh, for you as an individual, for us as a church. God's just going to use that to do great things. Uh, and so as always, I am joined by our OBC staff, uh, our uh, Minister of Music, Byron Marshall, uh, and our Director of Children's Ministries, Ms. Michaela Norris. How are you guys doing? Very good. good. Hope you are. Yeah, doing good, doing good. I think my voice is somewhat coming back. It started to try to go away from me on Sunday, but <laughs> what else is new at this point? Um, but we are currently in, we're continuing in the story of David. What is this, over a month now, just about? We've been kind of in the story of David and around the story of David, um, kind of jumping back and forth between, you know, Second Samuel and Chronicles and Psalms. And uh, there's just, one, just the story of David takes up so much of the biblical account. It's one of the things I don't know if I necessarily realized is just how much of biblical history at this point and in this section circles around David and the character of David and kind of what uh, in his life and the the ins and outs and ups and downs of David's life. And so, but there's something in David's story, definitely as we read this, I think there's just something in David's story that kind of grabs us when we read it. It kind of, it kind of draws us in and, um, and and really makes us take note of, of who David is. And so, what do you guys think? What, what what are some of the things about David's story that that you find compelling? Well, I've always you know always been keen to draw upon you know his musicianship and um, just the incredible um, experiences that he has that are so relatable to us. Um, the good, the bad, the ugly, and how we um, should respond when those peaks and valleys um, come about in our lives. Um, and I think he really gives us a great spectrum of that, um, especially in the Psalms. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, so of course, you know, the relationship of musicianship and, and so forth is what I really connect with him more. And I often find myself thinking about his situation through a musician's filter um, in my own life. If I had to deal with that situation, how would I do it? And how would music help me to deal with that, whether it's something positive, negative, um, and, and how is God going to use our music to, yeah, to cultivate some action when we're faced with a trial or a celebration or whatever it may be, mm-hmm. or if we need to lament in mm-hmm. some way or express our anger in a healthy way. I think David gives us great examples of how to do that in a positive and proper and biblical way yeah absolutely wow yeah i know um haven't fought any giants and, no haven't you know, fought any giants you know that'd be cool but no, <laughs> no. but <laughs> yeah there's definitely something in david's story that i think just there's parts of it that can draw us in that we find relatable and, you know you know, for me, I've always seen something in David. I, I love the fact that despite David's highs and lows, and he had some high highs and some low lows, but uh, there's always this this heart that kind of is drawn back to God. And we see that kind of throughout his story, that there's something in David that maybe wasn't outwardly visible. I mean, we see that multiple times that people kind of underestimated David. Obviously, the story of David and Goliath, but even even his own brothers, you know, at times would underestimate him and look down on him, uh, you know, and, the, and when Samuel came to his house to anoint the next king, they didn't even invite David to come into the meeting because he was the youngest and, you know, they, they thought kind of the most insignificant. And yet, whereas, you know, the Bible says there in First Samuel 16, I believe that where God, where man looks at the outward appearance, the, appearance, the Lord looks at the heart. 
And so there's something in David's heart that I think we just relate to and, and that we connect with. And I think it's reflected, like you said, in his songs and the songs that he sings and writes and um, but also in his actions, you know, not, not that all of his actions were good. Obviously, like we said, low, very low lows, but what makes him unique is that even in the midst of those lows, his heart for God seems to be what draws him back to a place of humility and repentance and a desire for God's zeal versus just, you know, continuing in his sin and, 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 and falling, you know, off the wagon, if you will. But I think that, I think we see that for sure in David. All right. Well, as we do each week, we always like to just share some different insights and thoughts that we have as we've read through the scriptures. And so we're continuing, like I said, through Second Samuel and uh, Chronicles and uh, and the Psalms as well. So Byron, what you got for us this week? Well, uh, howdy, everybody. Uh, I'm going to kind of piggyback a little bit, um, picking up where I left off last week. Um, I, I talked a little bit last week about... Um, you know, what What are we to do um, when we're faced with different temptations? And I looked at, you know, the instance of David and Bathsheba and, and the temptation he encountered there. Um, but um, kind of right after that in the scripture over in chapter 12, um, there were some interesting things that jumped out to me about just the value of godly counsel um, and this idea of... Um, you know, David's repentance um, from what he had sinned um, just earlier. You know, God often uses other believers to strengthen and encourage us and, uh, you know, to help enrich our lives uh, throughout uh, the course of our lives on earth here. And despite countless negative influences around us, you know, we can still find wisdom through the counsel of godly men and women. Um, and even as I say that, I get images of different people um, that come to mind, you know, pretty quickly. Um, and I think a wonderful example of this is uh, when we see here in Second Samuel, Nathan comes into the scene. He's a prophet, of course. Um, and he has this confrontation with David. Um, and God uses Nathan to bring uh, his servant David to repentance. Um, although the intense conviction kind of greatly pained David. Um, it was absolutely necessary, I think, in order for him to regain uh, his right relationship with God. Um, and it sort of reminded me of something I remember in Proverbs, um, where it teaches us repeatedly to seek uh, out godly counsel. Um, we must be careful that the person giving us counsel uh, is in step with the Lord. And while we are all you know, sort of fellow travelers on the path toward godly wisdom, we would be wise to learn on each other for support along the way. Um, and so coming back a little bit to David's repentance um, situation here. Uh, so what happens when we sin and delay our repentance? Uh, you know, I think there's some consequences we can see here. When David committed adultery with Bathsheba, he didn't repent right away. It wasn't an immediate response. It was only after some time later did he admit to his sin. And even then, he didn't do it on his own terms. Uh, God had to send a prophet to confront him. And then only after Nathan's visit uh, did David confess that sin and then repent of it. Um, so, of course, God's discipline followed uh, in a fairly severe form, um, perhaps so severe because of David's failure to repent sooner. I don't know. I kind of was toying with that question a little bit. But if you and I deal with our sin uh, genuinely, openly, and immediately, um, I think God can lessen the severity of our discipline. I think this makes sense in the light of the nature um, of discipline. Discipline is designed to get us to change and to obey uh, for something we've done. And if God sees that we want to cooperate and that we have purpose in our hearts to obey uh, the next time, then, you know, that sort of stern discipline uh, is not usually necessary or needed. Mm. <laughs> so I don't know. Those, those ideas sort of jumped out at me in the back part of that story there. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, just to, even the thought there of a wise counsel, and that seems to be a, a, a theme throughout David's life is that he... he was consistently trying to surround himself with people who would speak that truth with him. But there were other times that, 
you know, in, in other people's story around David, that that wise counsel affected him. You know, I'm thinking about like, you know, the story of Ahithophel that I just read, I think, uh, yesterday, you know, where his counsel was, was not good. And, and, and because of that, it ended up, you know, he, he sided with Absalom and that led to some other things. And so, yeah, I, I think there's definitely some, some good stuff. It reminds there. me when you have kids and they, they do something that they shouldn't have done it and they kind of procrastinate letting an adult know. Right, right. And they realize had they done it and come to somebody right, right after it happened, it would have been so much better. Yeah. You know, it is. Well, and I, I think we <laughs> fall into that trap of thinking we can conceal our sin. That yeah. It goes by that, I think I said it in a sermon a few weeks ago, that for some reason the darkness to us just seems so much safer than the light. Mm-hmm. Like, like, like concealing it and keeping it to ourselves just... For some, it's this lie that the enemy tells us that that if you'll just keep it to yourself, yeah, it'll go away. Yeah, it'll go away. <laughs> You're not going to feel any of those repercussions, mm-hmm. and you know that you will. You know because everything that's concealed eventually usually gets revealed, mm-hmm. and so it's just a matter of time. And so, yeah, I, there, there's such a freedom in Christ when we know that our sins are forgiven. We know that that it's been covered. And that we don't have to live in that shame and that 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 hiding. Mm-hmm. So, man, that's good. Miss Michaela. Um. So, okay. So we've been jumping around a lot, <laughs> which has been kind of hard, but it's also kind of interesting because I've never read the Bible like, like in the order that it's happened. I guess. Mm-hmm. So, um, it's been kind of interesting to see like David's life, how other people tell it, and then like kind of like the journal of David, like what he was feeling when he was going through certain things. So that's been kind of interesting to me. So this week, um, Psalms 13 stuck out to me a lot because at the beginning of the chapter, he opens with, um, verse one says, how long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? So he's like, dude, where are you? Like, (laughs) this sucks. And you're nowhere to be seen. Like, what is going on? Um, and it by the end of the chapter, he says, But I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. I will sing the Lord's praise, for he has been good to me. Hmm. So it's kind of his um, kind of his journey through, like, this sucks, where are you? To, like, you, you are good and you were there. And maybe I didn't see it, but you were there and you had me. And it just kind of kind of stuck out to me because I think sometimes we don't want to tell God when we're mad at him Hmm. because we think he's God or not. So we should just like be cool and be quiet. But (laughs) um, I think if we really believe in God, we also have to know that he's a big enough God to hear Mm -hmm. when we're mad at him. Um, Mm -hmm. And when we don't get why he's doing certain things and, and he can handle our frustrations just like he can handle our praises. So that just stuck out to me this week. That was one of the biggest revelations to me after I lost my brother. Good gracious, it's been almost five years ago now. Um, or longer. It's been longer. Um, seven or eight years ago now. But was this reality that God is okay with me being honest about what I'm feeling. And it doesn't mean that I go and I blaspheme God to everybody else and I tell everybody else how much I, you know, I'm angry right now at God. But it does mean that, that if I take my frustrations and my anger and, you know, even like you said, my, my feelings that, you know, this, this stinks. This is, this is, you know, if I, if I take that to God, that's just prayer. Mm-hmm. And, and I don't think it does us any favors um, to just bury that, you know, because when we just bury that, we just kind of internalize and we become bitter and angry and it just it just kind of festers there. And God doesn't want us to do that. Um, and so I, I definitely I definitely agree with what you're saying, that, that, that there's something in David's response there I think is healthy for us in being able to bring our very real human emotions to God unfiltered and unchecked and just being able to say, God, this is where I'm at right now. Mm-hmm. Now, the good thing, I think what we see with David's life is that God through his, th- through this process usually moves us from that place. 
and he has the ability to move us from that place. You know, we may start in this position of anger and questioning, God, where are you even at? But like you said, David doesn't end there. You know, God's God's working a process through this. And and I think that's 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 important to understand that part of that process is being open and honest about where we're what we're feeling in that moment. Good. Hmm. All right. Well, I was in Psalm chapter four, Psalm chapter four, uh, and, and just one verse. And, and it's a verse that has stuck to me and stuck out to me. It's been, been kind of special, uh, not just to me, but, but especially to my kids. But when I hear Psalms four, verse eight, the, the, the kid that I specifically think about is Noah. And, and Noah's my, I, Noah's the one I have to tell all my stories on. Uh, he, he's, he's kind of a special little guy and he, he's the one where all my, my, a sermon illustration seemed to come. Um, but Psalm 4, 8 says, In peace I will both lie down and sleep, for you alone, O Lord, make me dwell in safety. Of all of my kids, he probably is the one that has had the most problems just throughout his childhood uh, of getting to sleep, just whether it's because of fear or anxiety or something, just not having trouble turning his mind off. You know, he... he you know, but now when he's out, when he gets when he gets to sleep, he's out. He's like a rock. He, he's almost impossible to wake up. But uh, but as far as getting to sleep, he just he had some some problems with that for a while, and um, and, and that's normal for most kids. I mean, most kids at some point are afraid of the dark, and and and, and it's kind of difficult. But for Noah, I, it was more than that. He just he really had trouble turning his mind off. And there were those seasons where he would just lay down and he would just think about things. He would think about things going on in his friend's life. He would think about things that he was experiencing. And it just, it would bother him. And I remember there was a while when he was a little kid and these kind of fears and anxieties would creep up. Uh, he, he would actually come in the middle of the night and he would come uh, to my bed in, in the most creepy way imaginable. I mean, like, like, like he, he, he wouldn't like, you know, I wouldn't hear him coming, but I'd wake up and he wouldn't have said anything. He would just be standing there beside my bed with his face about, you know, a foot from mine, just looking at me. I mean, you want to have a heart attack, wake up with these two eyes just staring at you that you didn't know were there uh, when you rolled over. But, uh, and, and so that's what he would do. And, um, and we would sit and we'd talk usually and he'd go back to bed and be fine. But, uh, you know, as he got older, I started to find that he wouldn't come to me as much in the middle of the night, but instead he would just kind of stay there with his thoughts. And it would be, you know, the next day or some other time, uh, we'd be talking about it and, and he'd tell me kind of what, what he was going through. And, uh, I remember asking him a while back, you know, Noah, when you feel this way and when you're starting to feel anxious like that, do you, do you ever pray? Um, do you ever pray to God when you feel like that? And he said, yeah, yeah, of course I pray to God. And, that, and so I asked him, well, have you ever prayed scripture, you know, back to God? And he's like, no, I don't, I don't know what that means. <laughs> and so we started to look at this verse, this verse in Psalm 4, 8, that in peace, I will both lie down and sleep for you alone, O Lord, make me dwell in safety. And so I said, no, what I want to do is I'm just going to, because every night me and Noah, we have the same routine. He's the only ones of my kids that still to this day will come to me every night before he goes to bed, climb up into my lap. Noah's getting really big for that, but uh, he'll still come to me each each afternoon or each evening and come in my lap, and we'll we'll say our prayers together. And uh, and so this is what I started praying over him. You know that God, you promise us in our word that we can lie down and sleep in peace because you are with us, because you are the one who is sovereign over us, and you're the one who who make us dwell in safety. And so I just said, Lord, we just claim this promise. We claim this promise that 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 you are with us and that you are the, the God who is sovereign even over our sleep and over our fear. Uh, and so we just started praying that together. And uh, I'd like to tell you that all of his anxiousness just immediately went away, but that's not how prayer typically works. It's not a, a magic trick. It's There's something in prayer when we come to God in prayer and I believe especially when we come to God praying his words back to him, there's something intimate in that connection where God, I believe, delights in, in, in drawing us into that time and reminding us uh, that he is with us. And, and I think um, 
what more than anything, what that what that practice does uh, is it just reminded Noah in that instance that just like I, as his father, am always there for him. I'm always available if he needs to come to me and come to my, you know, bed. You know, as his dad, he has access. That's, that's one of the great things, one of the most beautiful things about being a father and a child relationship is is because he's my child, he has direct access. You know, if any other person from the church or somebody else comes to my bedside and stands beside it looking at me, we're going we gonna to throw fists. You know, it ain't going to go very well. <laughs> but for Noah to come do that, he's my, he's my son. He's my child. And so he has that kind of access to me. And that's what it means for us to be a child of God. It means to have direct access, that we can go directly into the throne room of God, standing at his feet and say, Dad, I need I need you right now. I need your comfort. I need your peace. I need you to hold me um, in the midst of my fears and, and struggles. And he does. It doesn't mean that it always takes away. I, and sometimes I think he doesn't take it away immediately because he delights in those moments when we're crawling up into his lap and allowing him to just be with us. And I think there's something beautiful in that even. So, but that's, that, that's Psalm 4, 8, Psalm 4, verse 8. Uh, and that's kind of what stuck out to me this week. All right. Well, guys, thank you all so much for sharing with this time. And I know we've gone a little bit longer, but I think we've had some good conversation and good just discussion of, uh, of this, this section of scripture. And so we're hoping that this, uh, we're hoping that this is just a tool in your toolbox as you're seeking to be faithful and following God, that, that as we just explain some of the, the insights and thoughts that we have, we hope that you have your own insights and thoughts. Uh, and we'd love to hear some of them. If there's something that you're reading, we have a Facebook page uh, devoted specifically to this group that's work, walking through the Word. Uh, we'd love for you to share some thoughts and insights that you had in your own reading there on the Facebook page. But uh, thank you guys for being with us this week. Now, let me pray for us, and then uh, we'll let you guys get back to your day. Father God, we thank you so much that you are a God that uh, that cares for us, that um, w- watches over us, Father, that uh, that we can be honest with when we're struggling with with the pain of this life and heartache and, and, and the real situations that we find ourselves in. Uh, God, we thank you that you're a God that we can come directly to and bring our fears and bring our needs and bring everything. And so, God, just be with us now. Uh, I pray that you'll bless this time in the Word uh, as people engage with you. And so, Lord, we love you and we praise you. Amen. Thank you guys for joining us this week. We'll catch you next time.